Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Ashok. And uh, I want to first th thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk in this really wonderful seminar series. Uh, so today I'm going to tell you about how mechanics uh, encodes behavior. Uh, and this is a story about emergent behavior and chaos in active filaments. And it's really inspired by this enigmatic uh, microorganism, a ciliate known as lacrimary olor. So I'm currently a Schmidt Science Fellow and postdoc at the Fletcher Lab at UC Berkeley. Uh, but this work actually started as kind of a passion project at the very end of my PhD and has continued ever since. So this is in collaboration with uh, Manu Prakash at Stanford. And uh, it really kind of started uh, in collaboration with Scott Coyle, who was a postdoc in Manu's lab. Uh, and we used to spend hours looking at this uh, weird organism under the microscope. Uh, and I was hooked enough to actually try to do some theory and computation for it, which is what you'll hear about today. Uh, so it's really an exciting time to study the physics of behavior uh, because of new tools uh, and new kinds of like analysis and AI tools. Uh, we can really understand behavior in a very wide range of organisms, all the way from wiggling worms to uh, large octopuses. Uh, and one of the kind of common themes that's kind of emerged here is this idea of like low dimensionality or emergent simplicity in behavior. So I think uh, a really uh, neat example of this is in the crawling of C. elegans, which is like an organism that many of you are familiar with. Uh, so in this paper, what they showed is that you can actually understand the behavior of this organism crawling on an agar plate, for example, uh, in a very low dimensional sense, using just these four different uh, shape modes, which they called uh, eigenworms. Um, and even in much more complex organisms like the octopus, the uh, behavior of the arm, for example, is actually surprisingly low dimensional. So the octopus arm has like order 10 power seven neurons and 10 power six muscle fibers, and essentially has like an infinite number of degrees of freedom but when the octopus reaches out and grabs its food, it does so in a way that's very similar to the way we would reach out and grab something. So there are these joints that propagate along the arm and the overall uh, kinematics of the arm is surprisingly low dimensional. So uh, that kind of sets the stage for the flavor of what you're gonna to see today. Uh, but we are gonna be operating at a much, much smaller scale uh, than, than an octopus, we're gonna be at the kind of same scale as the first talk today, which is a scale of single cells. Uh, and particularly, we're gonna be thinking about single cells, which are uh, ciliates. So these are free living eukaryotic cells, which are covered by thousands of cilia. And uh, what is remarkable about them is that though they are single cells, uh, they are capable of behaviors that one might ascribe to animals, such as walking, jumping, hunting. And I'll show you one more example of that in this talk. And the uh, fundamental units of activity in these cells is of course the cilia, which is actually a, a, an incredible organelle capable of generating uh, fluid uh, stresses on the surrounding uh, water. And because of the large number of shapes that this, these organisms come in, these cilia are actually organized on these complex manifolds and surfaces. And the protagonist for today's talk is actually the one that you see highlighted here. Uh, it's called Lacrimeria olor, and it has this really uh, incredible geometry. And if you look at this organism under the microscope, this is what you would see. So this is a real time video of this organism behaving under a microscope. And you can see that it has like this 50 micron cell body, but it has this long neck like extension and what it's actually doing is it's using that neck-like extension to hunt for prey. And thanks to Scott, uh, we have this really wonderful uh, video of this uh, doing what it does in a pond water sample. I want to pl play this video for you. So here is a cell sitting in this debris here, and here is its neck, which is more than a millimeter in size. And right there, it grabbed this other single cell organism and it's going, to, it's going to reel that in very much like how you would reel a fishing line. So you're going, to, you're going to see this unfortunate organism is going to get devoured and it's going to get pulled back into this uh, cell body, okay? So that's actually the behavior that really hooked me uh, into actually trying to understand what's going on. And so, as I said, the neck length can be like several tens or even 20 times the cell body and uh, it's incredibly dynamic, the behavior. 
So uh, just as I uh, mentioned before, the behavior, even though it's uh, complex, it's pretty stereotypical. And you can actually describe the shape modes that the neck takes in these uh, four different shape modes. And you can really think of a lot of the behaviors that the organism does, for example, reorienting, steering, and whipping uh, as actually trajectories of these shape modes uh, changing over time. And the functional outcome of that is that in a very uh, short time, a surprisingly short time, this organism can densely uh, search the space around it and literally visit every single point that's within its reach given the size of the neck. So you can see that very clearly here, where even in a time of 10 to 15 minutes, the organism has saturated all the places uh, that's available next to it. So this is an example of a search behavior, which is both exhaustive, but also rapid. Okay, so that is basically the fundamental question you want to answer today is like what actually underlies this complex cell behavior? And the approach you're going to take is actually going to differ from all these other things I showed you before. So here we are not going to just uh, be satisfied by looking at the dimensionality of the dynamics, but we're going to ask, can we actually put in the ingredients that we think are important and actually see what behavior comes out? So this is going to be a bottom-up approach to understanding the cell behavior uh, that you see. And we know something about what ingredients go into this, thanks to uh, the experiments that Scott did. Uh, so one of them is, of course, the cilia. So as you can see in this movie here, uh, the cell bodies are uh, densely covered by these cilia. And what is more, these cilia are actually going to uh, switch between these periods of extension and compression. So during extension, the cilia are actually applying stresses that draw out the neck. And during compression, they're going to push back the neck and cause it to buckle. Uh, I hope that's uh, coming across in that video. Uh, this ciliary activity is, of course, constrained by the cytoskeleton and the membrane that the cell has. And that's, I think, an uh, equally fascinating thing that I would suggest many of you should look at. So the cell has this helical cytoskeleton uh, as well as contractile, contractile proteins. But for the purposes of this work, we're going to treat this as a simple elastic uh, substrate, at least at short time scales. And I would recommend this paper where they look more into the mechanics of the neck itself. And lastly, but definitely not the least, there's a very key constraint that underlies this cell behavior, which is that the cilia, because they're anchored to the cytoskeleton, are forced to follow the instantaneous shape of the neck. So this is a classical constraint in mechanics known as a follower force constraint. And it was first studied in the context of rocket engines. And basically what it means is that the force that you're applying is actually dependent on the instantaneous shape of the neck. And that's basically why it's a follower force. And a more common everyday example of this is the flow of water through a very flexible hose. So you'll see the hose kind of whipping around at the end. Okay, so th these are the ingredients. And to actually uh, make uh, a theoretical model, so we actually built this active filament by stringing together these colloids so that we could use this powerful active colloidal hydrodynamics framework. So each of these colloids can either be active or passive. And in the simplest toy model that we could come up with, all the colloids are passive except for the one at the tip. So this is basically a tip activated uh, active filament. And the activity basically is uh, given by these periods of compression and extension. And uh, you can clearly kind of see that it's like completely deterministic, uh, at least to start with. And the filament is constrained by axial and bending springs. So to kind of give you intuition for uh, uh, thinking about the system, one non-dimensional number that will come up uh, through the talk is this activity number, which is essentially the ratio of the active uh, stresses in the system uh, by the uh, stresses due to bending and elasticity. So that's the one non-dimensional number that you should uh, keep in mind. And the second uh, parameter I'll talk about is the time scale of the activity itself. Uh, relative to the intrinsic time scale of the filament. And this is basically the time it takes for one compression and one extension cycle. Uh, and in terms of the modeling, we basically constrain the filament using these connecting springs as well as bending springs that you can see here. And we also have uh, uh, interaction constraints so that the filament does not interact with itself. 
And in terms of the hydrodynamics, we actually implement a many body hydrodynamic equation that captures both the passive stresses due to translation and rotation, but also the active stresses. So for example, the colloids can have a surface slip velocity. So you can actually capture the many body hydrodynamics of the active stresses through this equation of motion. So we take those equations of motion and we integrate them over thousands of activity cycles that are uh, periodic and deterministic, at least to start with. And we basically look at what emerges at the end of it. So to give you intuition, uh, I'll start with just playing a movie of a single cycle of compression and extension. And here you can also visualize the fluid flow around the filament. And uh, if I've not already mentioned it, this is at low Reynolds number. So inertia is not important and viscous stresses are dominant. So that's a cycle of compression followed by extension. And you can see kind of intuitively that compression causes the filament to buckle and change shape rapidly and extension kind of straightens it out in a completely new direction. But when we looked at this over uh, several more cycles, so several thousands of cycles, we were in for a surprise. So we actually found a surprisingly rich uh, space of behaviors. So on the left, I'm showing you an example of periodic behaviors where the filament actually uh, keeps revisiting the same space after a period of two cycles or six cycles or even 10 cycles. But on the other hand, uh, at other uh, values of the parameter space, we actually see a behavior which is qualitatively different. So we see a behavior where the filament never uh, returns to the same place, even for very, very long times. So this is an example of an aperiodic behavior. And you can see that it's actually starting to fill the space around it uh, pretty effectively. And over long enough times, you get a search cloud. So if you look at the, all the positions at the tip of the filament visits, you get a search cloud that's quite different for periodic and aperiodic behaviors, where the aperiodic behaviors are kind of like this dense sampling of the surrounding space. And not only that, uh, if you look at the behavior now, both as a function of the activity number, as well as the time scale that I mentioned, the behavior is really rich. So you see periods of uh, you know, periodic behaviors, but you also have these periods of aperiodic behaviors interspersed in, in the middle, and it's, it's a very, very rich uh, behavioral space. And this basically made us dig deeper. So what actually gives rise to such a rich dynamical regime in this you know, seemingly simple uh, uh, toy system? So to kind of understand this more, we uh, wanted to actually reduce the dimensionality of the description if possible. So if you use a principal component analysis and look at the participation ratio of the eigenvectors, you can actually uh, have a quantitative uh, way of asking how, what is the dimensionality of a certain dynamical system? And here we see that the PCA dimension uh, never really goes more than three. So for, for a pretty large range of the activity number, the PCA dimension is around three. And so what this means is that we can actually take these complex filament shapes and use principal component analysis to describe them in terms of just three shape modes. So the dimensionality is uh, pretty low. And what this it means is we can actually visualize the dynamics as a trajectory in 3D space. So using that, what we did is we started out filaments that are arbitrarily close to each other in shape space. And we asked what happens to the evolution of really close initial conditions when the dynamics is aperiodic. And here is a visualization of the same. So I'm showing you 10 different uh, filaments which have been initialized. I don't know if this movie is playing. Oops. There we go. So these are 10 different filaments that have been initialized and we're gonna evolve this over time. And if you keep watching this, on the left, you have the filament. Oops, when I touch it, something happens. Let's try that again. <laughs> on the left, you have the filament shape, and on the right, you have the shape modes, and you see this very complex attractor in shape in, fill, uh, in the shape space. And you can see that over a finite number of cycles, these initially uh, very, very close filament shapes actually diverge exponentially. And so this is actually like a very classical demonstration of chaos. 
So what we are seeing here is that the aperiodicity that we see is actually a symptom of chaotic dynamics in the intrinsic dynamics. And you can see this by uh, plotting the Lyapunov exponent, which tells you something about the rate of divergence of these small fluctuations. And you can see that over a fairly small uh, range of activity numbers, you get windows of periodicity as well as windows of aperiodicity, which are due to chaos. Okay. But if you're someone like me, that's not very convincing because the question comes, you know, why is the system chaotic? Like, can we go a little deeper, okay? And uh, what was also very interesting was right around the same time, there were reports of chaotic dynamics in a completely different context where people were looking at flexible filaments that were evolving under oscillatory shear flow. So you can kind of see that it's, it's a very related system. It's not a self-driven system. It's like a globally driven system, but people have found a similar kind of chaotic dynamics even in that system. So that really made us uh, think about, oh, like, can we uh, understand this at an even more deeper level? So what we did is instead of three degrees of freedom, we asked, can we actually do with a single degree of freedom? So this was something that we just tried. So we actually realized that if we just looked at the mean filament orientation and just looked at the dynamics of the mean filament orientation, uh, can we actually understand more about the dynamics? So here, I want you to think of those dynamics as an iterated map. So what you're doing is you're taking the filament shape at a given cycle and you're mapping to a filament shape in the next cycle and you're basically repeating that operation over and over. And for the case of a simple map where you're just using the filament orientation angle, it will look something like this. So it's basically just theta n plus one is a map that maps theta n to theta n plus one. So this kind of leads to this question, like does such a map even exist? Like can we actually uh, make any analytical progress and what does this map tell us? Okay, so here we actually again kind of uh, cheated a little and we looked at the simulation data and there was a little bit of a clue in the simulation data. So if you even look at the return map of theta n plus one versus theta n for the case of aperiodic dynamics, what we notice is that there's quite a lot of structure in, the, in, in, this, in this return map. Even though the dynamics itself looks chaotic, this has a lot of structure. And what we realized is that if we just solve the equation of motion for a single cycle, we can actually do a pretty good job of predicting the shape of this map, okay? So you can clearly see here that the red curve is a single cycle prediction. So all it's saying is that given a filament orientation initially, if I have a single cycle of compression and extension, what is the filament uh, orientation in the next cycle? That's all I'm doing. And you can see that it has a shape that's very similar to the full simulation data where I'm solving for the all the degrees of freedom. Okay, what can we do with this map? So I feel this map actually finally lets us understand what actually leads to chaos. So at very low activity numbers, this map is fairly linear and also diagonal, okay? So this is the map at very low activity numbers and this intuitively makes sense. So if you don't really uh, activate the filament, it's going to basically preserve its orientation over a single cycle. But as you increase the activity, you see something that's quite different. And you can see here that uh, the fixed points of this map actually correspond to limit cycles in the dynamic. So basically this tells you that the dynamics is gonna be periodic with a certain uh, cycle. And if you have a fixed point of f of theta star equal to theta star, that's a period one dynamic. So that means the filament shape is gonna repeat every cycle. And you can see that at low activity numbers, that's all you have. So you essentially have a filament that's going to just be straight and it's just gonna get compressed and extended, compressed and extended, okay? But then as you increase the activity number, you see that first of all, this map starts becoming nonlinear, okay? And second, you see a new class of fixed points appear, which are actually with this negative diagonal. But what is really interesting is that because of the axis of symmetry of this problem, these fixed points actually correspond to period 2M cycles, okay? So these are cycles where the filament is going to repeat every even period. And if I increase the activity number even more, you finally see that you get a fixed point which is now unstable. So which means that there are no stable limit cycles in the dynamics of the system. But remember that this is just a prediction from the single degree of freedom of the filament orientation angle, okay? 
but can this tell us something so one the, one of the predictions would be that if all periodic cycles are unstable that would be the onset of chaotic dynamics okay so what do we see what we see is that this uh, simple uh, math actually has quite a lot of predictive power so here i'm showing you the fixed points predicted by this map and their stability is shown here and you can clearly see that the onset of chaos is actually very close to what we see in the full simulations with the entire degrees of freedom and hydrodynamics. Uh, and this is not just true for the case of increasing activity number, it also is true when you have uh, increasing time scale. Yeah. But you have about four minutes, four and a half minutes. Perfect. So what this means is that we can use this very simple iterated map to predict the onset of chaos in this complex filament system and also use this map as a design tool. So I'm going to show you a few examples of that, uh, where can we actually start engineering these filament behaviors using these insights from nonlinear dynamics that I've shared with you so far. One very simple example of this, which might tr seem trivial when I tell you, is that it lets you return a filament to its equilibrium orientation very, very quickly. Okay, so here is an example that just by tuning the amplitude of the activity, I can take any filament shape and I can move it rapidly to the equilibrium orientation. In contrast, if I just let bending, like the equilibrium bending, let the filament come back to the straight orientation, it would take uh, at least an order of magnitude more in time. So this is just a very simple example where by going from a nonlinear to a linear regime, you can home the filament. The next is one of my favorites, which is that you can actually use this to implement what I call a local and global search. So you can actually have periods of rapid activity followed by periods of longer activity to have the filament search space locally and then very quickly uh, scramble and go to a completely different location and search space there uh, in a dense fashion. So to kind of complete the loop, we kind of asked, you know, what are the activity patterns that uh, Lacrimaria Olor is following? So what is the cell doing? So to do this, we went back to our experimental data and we segmented it to uh, basically quantify the periods of extension and compression that are readily visible when just looking at the cell under a microscope. So you can see here one such example of a segmented data set where you can see the cell switching between periods of compression and extension. And uh, if you kind of look at that uh, over time, you kind of see something like this. You get a activity trace that looks like that. And when we looked at that for enough number of cells, uh, we were actually really surprised to find that this activity duration was actually log normally distributed. So what this means is that both the duration of extensional phases as well as compressional phases kind of neatly fall into this log normal distribution. Okay, using this insight, we can actually go back to our simulations and kind of ask if we force it using uh, temporal log normal forcing and spatially if we follow what Lacrimaria Olor does, where during extension, you have this, uh, all the colloids are active and, but during compression, the tip colloid is not active. So this is something very special about the cell that I have not captured so far in the model, but we're gonna put that in now. Um, then we actually see behaviors which are quite interesting. So you can see here that uh, the cell does something very similar to a local and global search where there are short periods of compression that are not really scrambling the cell orientation, but longer periods of compression are very effective at scrambling the cell orientation. So you can see that this basically leads to a very similar uh, thing to the local and global search that I showed you a few slides back. Uh, and if you look at this uh, over long periods, you actually can uh, start mapping some of the qualitative features that we see in the experiments. For example, we see in experiments, this region of dense sampling near the base uh, of the cell, which you can also see now in the simulation data. Okay. So with that, I'll quickly summarize what I told you today. Uh, so this active filament model, really inspired by Lacrimaria Olor, is a very simple toy system to understand this active matter system where you have activity in this follower force configuration. And even in the simple case of tip activity with periodic forcing, you have quite a rich space of behaviors. 
this really uh, you know made us dive deep and actually discover a new route to chaos uh, for an active elastodynamic system um, and also uh, understand what leads to these chaotic dynamics by using this uh, simple iterated map of the filament orientation angle and lastly uh, uh, i brought it back to the cell experiments where we are starting to understand, you know, why is it that lacrimaria allor has this particular kind of temporal distribution in the activity, as well as spatial distribution uh, along this uh, along the cilia. So uh, uh, one of the key things here is that the nonlinear mechanics of this uh, follower force filament is actually a key driver of the observed behaviors that we see in the experiments. I'll just leave you with uh, two thoughts. Uh, so when you think about um, animal behavior. This is the paradigm that we are used to, where you look at motor activity uh, in the neurons uh, acting through a neuromuscular system to kind of give rise to the behavior that we can observe. And I think what I've shown you today is kind of an interesting example where this is all happening, but the generator of the behavior is actually just nonlinear mechanics, uh, where you start with an activity pattern and you uh, get out uh, like this emergent behavior at, at the end of it. And this leads to some very interesting questions, uh, in my opinion. One is, you know, how controllable is the filament shape? Like, you know, uh, by having arbitrary patterns of activity, can we actually steer the filament to do goal-directed movements? Uh, one can hope, like, this is kind of like science fiction, but like, you know, can we have like a pick and place robo, uh, but at the micro scale? So imagine a robo that I can program to, you know, precisely move you know, cargo or cells from one place to another. Uh, I think it's very interesting to think about control strategies like this because it's going to be very hard to implement the kind of sensors and actuators that we can for macro scale robots at the micro scale. Um, with that, I'll thank my co authors and collaborators again, uh, as well as funding sources, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Deepak. Yeah, that was a fascinating talk. Uh... So on behalf of the audience, uh, let me applause. Uh, are they, I can see a bunch of questions in the chat. Uh, so let me, uh, let's, let's just take them in order. Uh, so uh, uh, the first question is, uh, Avanish uh, Narla, are the periodic behaviors in the filaments shown with noise or even shown with noise? Uh, so, yeah, that's a good question. So I guess the question is about, uh, you know, how sensitive are these kind of limit cycles to noise? Um, yeah, what we found is that uh, there does seem to be a threshold noise where you still see, you know, periodic like behaviors and you need enough noise to actually get something similar to the aperiodic behaviors. Uh, it's not something that we have quantified uh, very uh, very precisely, but uh, we have some initial results which show that there seems to be a threshold noise that you need to kick a periodic behavior into what looks more like the chaotic behavior. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very interesting. So uh, Mehrana has a question. How does period of the activity compare with the period, uh, period of the motion? Is it possible to get a period for the motion that is different from the period of the activity? Uh, yes. Uh, so, for example, uh, you can see this movie here. I don't know if I can play it, uh, but uh, you can, I think one of the things that's interesting is that uh, you can actually get these period doubling behaviors where you have periods that are like even multiples of the period of the activity that's driving the filament. And something uh, quite interesting is we also see sometimes odd periods, which I don't really understand yet. Uh, so, yes. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so Rafael's question is being mostly addressed, he says. Uh, Rafael, do you want to add a follow-up? Or... Uh, no, it's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so Jing, uh, do you want to just unmute and ask your question? Sure. Um, well, uh, this is a really a fascinating talk. Uh, so I'm wondering, so in your model, uh, you only have one active beat at the tip, right? So, and when you say compression force, is it somehow like a long range force uh, that's somehow acting towards the root? Uh, uh, so yeah, so in at least like most of the results I presented were with these tip activity uh, uh, filaments uh, and the compression force is actually self, uh, it's like, uh, it's like self propulsion. So you can, I think the simplest way I can think about it is that 
imagine a micro swimmer that's sitting at the tip of the filament. Uh, that's the type of active stress that's being exerted. Uh, so the, the direction of the compressive force is actually the local tangent of the tip. So it is, it's not directed towards the center. So it's not constrained in a global sense, but it's constrained locally by the shape of the filament. Okay. And so in reality, what would be the mechanism kind of generating that kind of force? Uh, in, in, in the cell, that would be the cilia. So the, so the cell has cilia that are densely coating the neck and the beat plane of the cilia is actually going to either pull the neck out. So that's the extension okay. uh, or they're going to push the neck back, which is the compression. And we are simplifying that by putting all the activity at the tip Though in the end, we do go back to a uh, system where the activity is distributed along all the colloids. I see. I see. Thank you.